Well, hey, I was right. Blink, stash, Anything we need to know, as soon as I find out, you'll One, know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Okay, here we go. I've wondered for a very long time how Joe Rogan, this guy who describes himself as a professional fool, went from hosting a game show where he eats cockroaches with contestants to becoming the host of perhaps the most popular podcast on earth. And you're going, no, and that's how you die. Now listen, I am not a Joe Rogan listener. Well, at least I wasn't before this story. But by now, I am. Because by now, me and my team have listened to a lot of Joe Rogan. If you didn't know whether or not people agree with you or disagree with you, I think that'd probably be better overall for people. I wanted to understand where this guy came from, what his deal is, what does he say during these like two to three hour long episodes that are listened to by millions of people? Because for better or worse, he is influencing a lot of people. So let me show you how an average Joe like Rogan can sit around getting high, talking to his friends, and somehow get millions of people to tune in. Now, I know that talking about Joe Rogan can cause some controversy. But, but at the end of that round, he was yeah. deep <laughs> Before we get into it, let's thank today's sponsor. The internet is becoming kind of a dangerous place. Like people on the internet who wanna do bad things and steal from you are getting better at doing that. Luckily, there are tools that exist to help protect you. One of those tools is NordVPN. NordVPN started as a VPN, but it's much more than that now. A VPN, by the way, allows you to connect to the internet securely via a different country. This allows you to do a lot of things like watch Netflix in another country or to even get price discounts on things because there's so much price discrimination based on your geography. I use NordVPN kind of like second nature. It's just one click away, it kind of runs in the background. But again, NordVPN is much more than that these days. In recent years, in response to all of this more sophisticated criminal activity on the internet, NordVPN has developed a suite of threat protection tools, tools that allow you to be more safe on the internet with just one click. They recently introduced NordPass, which is a password manager. You can store all of your passwords securely in one place. Or Nord Locker, which is a place where you can store all of your files securely on the cloud, backing them up and keeping them safe and being able to access them from anywhere. Nord has become a ad blocker and a tracker blocker. With one click, you can stop intrusive trackers from following you on the internet. You can block intrusive ads, shield yourself from malware while you're online, and you can generally stay safer while surfing the internet. This sounds like a lot of things, but it's all packaged into one thing, NordVPN, who is the sponsor of today's video. They're a longtime supporter of the channel. I'm very grateful to them, not only for sponsoring our videos, but also for the product that they make. It's a good product. I use it all the time and I'm grateful for it. So if you want to try this out, NordVPN, which by the way is like the fastest VPN out there, you should click the link in my description. It's nordvpn.com slash Johnny Harris. There is a 30 day money back guarantee. You can try it out for up to 30 days and get all of your money back if it's something that you actually don't think is very useful to you. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you in on an extra extended subscription to NordVPN. You get the two year plan plus four extra months. Links in the description. Thank you NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Let's get back to Joe Rogan. Okay, so it's 1987, and here's a 20-year-old Joe Rogan taking a guy down with a spinning back kick at a Taekwondo competition. Always moving to new schools, always dealing with new kids, and I wasn't big, and I didn't know how to fight, and I got picked on, and I didn't like it. So I said, I want to I want to figure out how to fight. And eventually, he got really good at it. I was competing from the time I was 15. I just threw myself into it. It's all I did every day. And then one summer night in 1988, when he was 21, he went to an open mic night at a comedy club in Boston. Your legs are sprawled out on the bed like Bambi trying to walk in a frozen lake and banging your head against the headboard. I love it when we make love. His friends goaded him to get up on stage and perform a stand-up set. It must have gone really well because soon after, Rogan moves to LA to make it big in comedy. By the 90s, he was showing up in TV shows as the goofy, lovable comedic relief. Cause the light's better over here. <laughs> Damn, everything's better over here. <laughs> But this sitcom -y thing wasn't his dream. He loved comedy and fighting. Enter UFC, Ultimate Fighting Championship. Okay, so it's the late 90s and now Joe Rogan is like a UFC commentator personality, interviewing fighters backstage. 
This is actual footage of his first appearance. They are anticipating a wipeout in the finals. Yeah! And I mean, this guy's good. Like, he's got such a magnetic personality, even back then. By the time he was in his 30s, it was the 2000s, and Joe had proven to be a talented host and entertainer. And he was chosen to host a show where contestants would be pushed to their limits to test their fear. It was a show aptly named Fear Factor. <laughs> Fear Factor. I mean, I remember this from my childhood. The show had like a huge impact on our media culture. I think it kind of laid the foundation for sensational reality TV. It was disgusting and sometimes just downright horrifying. But honestly, it was brilliant because it was impossible to look away. Yeah! Sherry, relax. Relax, Sherry. Sherry, relax. Ah! So Fear Factor was like the big leveling up for Joe Rogan. You know what? Again, very fortunate. It was a great gig, plenty of money, and it was all good. And it definitely helped my stand up because it gave me f you money too. It gave mm. me the, the ability to not worry about like having money in the bank. And by the end of the early 2000s, Joe had a lot of experience. He was an entertainer, he was a comedian, he was a host, he was an actor. He had built a hefty network of interesting people. He was charismatic and tough and funny and hardworking. All of the ingredients he needed for his next move, podcasting. On Christmas Eve 2009, Joe and one of his comedian friends recorded a two hour podcast. It was a sprawling conversation covering everything from conspiracy theories to game addiction to sensory deprivation tanks. It was honestly a good omen for what this show would become. He called his podcast the Joe Rogan Experience, kind of a nod to Jimi Hendrix. Now remember, in 2009, podcasts weren't really a thing yet. You had a bunch of like sort of radio shows that were making it onto podcasts like This American Life or Planet Money, Stuff You Should Know, but this was all very new at the time. But that changed when people could stream podcasts on demand with their new little internet connected pocket computers. Right from the beginning, Joe Rogan's show was fast, prolific, and consistent, uploading multiple times a week. And by the end of his second year on the show, he had had a bunch of big names as guests. We've done everything wrong. We, these were young male elephants. They're fa they are the fastest moving creatures, I think, in the wild once they get going. Oh. And uh, they hate bright, like bright shirts, which of course we were wearing. Uh, they don't, they're spooked by people holding implements, uh, which of course, that's what we were doing. And they particularly don't like being herded by people one, you know, thousandth their weight. <laughs> At the beginning, they were mostly comedians and fighters. I'm thinking about Tom Cruise and Scientology. Mm. There is a man using every ounce of what Scientology is offering to make himself the best available man that he's capable of being. Yeah. Then you've got Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> but soon he started to branch outside of comedians and fighters to a different genre of people. Let's call them thinkers. Workers don't have the right to engage in collective bargaining in the United States until the 1930s. That's where that whole idea of the let the market decide falls apart. He would have philosophers on, and politicians, scientists, you name it. The show started to become just a grab bag of any interesting person Joe Rogan wanted to have a conversation with. Neil deGrasse Tyson, the astrophysicist, appeared a few times. You get a multiverse. We didn't pull that out of our ass, that came out of the equations. Soon, it was bigger and bigger names. Elon Musk, Russell Brand, Nick Kroll, Jay Leno, Jordan Peterson, Wiz Khalifa, Dr. Phil, Travis Barker. By the late 2010s, the Joe Rogan experience was reaching around 11 million listeners per episode, making it the most popular podcast ever, at least on platforms like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Like, I had never listened to this, but I knew of Joe Rogan because he's kind of everywhere when you're scrolling through any podcast app. So then in 2020, Spotify was like, I want a piece of this, like giant popular podcast. And they bought the exclusive rights to the podcast for $200 million. Which is unbelievably insane. This was a huge deal for Joe Rogan, but also for podcasts. <laughs> That's go. Even after this big deal, the show retained its unfiltered quality. It still was Joe Rogan sitting around, chatting with mostly dudes, talking openly and unfiltered for hours. You don't know what a bear is. I've seen a bear in the wild. When you see a bear in the wild, you're like, oh! You're, you don't give a f about me. Often getting progressively more high with his guest. Do people get upset at you if you do certain things? There's uh, tobacco and marijuana in there. Uh, I, I'm getting text messages from 
from, from friends saying, what the hell are you doing smoking weed? Okay, so my job has apparently turned into getting super deep into watching stuff that I never watched before, like North Korean films, and now Joe Rogan podcasts. Like I've dedicated a significant amount of my time over the past several months to watching this show. And even still, I'm just scratching the surface. These episodes are long. They're like two and a half hours on average, and there are almost 2,000 of them. We're talking thousands and thousands of hours of this stuff. Luckily for this story, I had help from our story producer, Alex, to help us listen to a lot of this stuff. I also spoke with some longtime Joe Rogan listeners for some insight. And here in the office, we actually had some pretty nice heated debates about Joe Rogan. <laughs> And now, after my baptism by Joe Rogan, I now have some big takeaways, some things I want to say. Number one, Joe hates boxes. And people love that he hates boxes. He spends a lot of time lambasting our society's need to fit people into buckets, into labels. I think this left, white, right paradigm is really kind of fucking foolish at this point. And indeed, it's fairly impossible to put Joe Rogan into the standard ideological boxes that we're all sort of pressured to fit into. Most of our media discourse loves boxes, loves to inflame our super identities, the things that we must believe in order to be a good liberal or a good conservative. What kind of opinions are okay to have because they don't interfere with anybody else's life and it's just your philosophy and the way you look at the world that you should be able to express that opinion and express those ideas in front of someone else who has an opposing idea and they tell you why they disagree. And so before I listened to a million hours of the show, I had mostly seen Joe Rogan in the context of like short little edited clips of like smackdowns showing like some egregious thing that Joe Rogan had said that he was transphobic or fatphobic or misogynistic or racist. There's a lot of these mashups out there. She's giant. Like look at the yeah. size of her head, her formerly male head. Yeah. That's a giant we woman. Walk into <laughs> <laughs> we walked into We walked in dude. <laughs> we 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 walked in the door and there was no white people. There was no white people. Wow. That video is so bad it actually made me miss the N-word video. And when you watch this stuff, it's so easy to just like slot him into like, oh, he must be like some far right sort of like racist reactionary commentator. So I was surprised, honestly, when I listened to a lot of this guy to find out that his politics actually lean mostly left. She's right. the wife of the best president that we right, have had right. in our lifetime. He openly and earnestly voices support for everything from universal health care to abortion to gay marriage to recreational drugs. I lean way left when it comes to those kind of things, gay rights and Things like social programs for disenfranchised people and disenfranchised communities. I, w mm -hmm. I lean way le Like, if I want my tax dollars to go to anything, I want it to go to making people's lives easier. I'm not right-wing at all. Oh, okay. No. That's wild. No, there's nothing about me that's right-wing. He even endorsed Bernie Sanders, the Democratic Socialist, in 2020 after having him on the show. <laughs> there's not a single human that can speak for all the American no, people. I but you that. could look out for the interests of the American people. And I think Bernie Sanders definitely does do that. You got three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of the American society. You don't see that on television too much, do you? No, you don't. Three people. You got the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 92%. What are the misconceptions of you? Because here's, here's the, if you go to the knee-jerk conservative reaction, you talk to people who are not interested in anyone that wants to be a democratic socialist, they hear the name Bernie Sanders, the negative implications are that you are somehow or another going to take their money, right? right? Is that annoying to you? Yes, it is. Of course it is. Oh, and here he is with presidential hopeful Andrew Yang, agreeing with him on the super progressive idea of universal basic income. My initial knee-jerk reaction was, get the f*** out of here. Like, universal basic income, just going to give people money, they're just going to be lazy, nothing's ever going to get done, that's a terrible idea. And then I started paying attention to the rise of AI and automation and how many jobs are going to get taken yes, away yes. from... And then once you see the actual numbers, it's pretty staggering. But despite thinking that, he presents his ideas in this very kind of anti-woke, anti-political correctness, say whatever you want type of vibe. And this is confusing, but also very appealing. People love to listen to a guy whose views and language are all over the place. I think for a lot of people, it's like a respite from the predictable lineup of popular voices that tow a predictable list of beliefs, opinions, views, and enemies. Rogan's style is rare, and I think people like that. Which gets me to my second big takeaway. Joe Rogan sells contrarianism. That is his product. A quick reminder, 
that Joe Rogan isn't just a guy. He is a commercial icon, a seasoned performer who performs for an audience for money. He knows what people want, and he is selling something very popular, an alternative to the endless reductionist, polarized name calling of our current discourse. They all do the same move. They drop down and do the splits. That's what I think when I'm watching your shows too, you know, all the same stuff. But <laughs> And he goes to great lengths to stake himself out as this anti-authority, anti-establishment platform where anyone can come and talk. If you're in one camp, you're supposed to have all the opinions that one camp has. Yeah. And if you do not align with all the opinions that, that one camp has, you find yourself cast out of the group. No woke police, no mainstream media bias, no corporate deception, just an earnest, curious guy trying to find the truth and not really worrying too much about changing his language to fit the politically correct sensitivities of the day. What I didn't anticipate was social media and the echo chambers that it would provide. Right. And that these ideological echo chambers also come with virtue signaling and that people get on these things because you're, you're only dealing with a short amount of characters and you state something that you know is going to get a bunch of likes and people right. are very addicted to likes. The fans I talk to love this about Joe Rogan. Like he's like the antidote to like the corporate mainstream biased media that's polarizing us all. And frankly, I think he leans into this as his brand. Which gets me to my third point, and this is where I have my biggest critique of Joe Rogan. Joe lets people talk, and talk, and talk, and talk. The principles of human interaction on this planet uh, are largely dictated by our ability to discuss things, even if you disagree. As we've seen, Joe has had a huge variety of guests on his show. A lot of these are like famous people that you just get to watch talk in this sort of unfiltered way, like Robert Downey Jr. or Miley Cyrus. But then you also have a lot of people with big opinions and big points of view from super mainstream and respected voices to experts on like really specific science things. But then you have a handful of a lot of controversial fringe characters, people who have been censored or canceled canceled by the mainstream media. And honestly, I think Joe takes huge pride in having this spectrum of different points of view. Now, I don't know Joe Rogan, but my guess is that half of this is his personality. He seems to be a guy who loves to discuss things with people. He seems to have an open mind. But I think half of this, again, is a response to the upkeep of his brand. I think he likes the appeal of being this anti-mainstream platform where anyone who has been canceled by the woke mob can come and get their fair shake, tell their side of the story. I mean, it's you don't have to agree on, on everything in order to have a common sense of the important values that, that unify the country or should. Yes. And here comes my big critique. I think there's a fallacy tucked into all of this. When Joe has these people on, it almost feels like he's giving them a chance to tell their side of the story. Like they don't have a place to, to tell their side and they've been unfairly censored. But I think this is flawed thinking. Not everyone who has a point of view and who is famous has ideas worth hearing or debating in our society. I really believe that. There are people who've gotten famous simply because They've made a career off of being loud and mean, and human nature loves that for some reason. The f Senate! The f Senate voted here's to a, kill babies! Like, here's a show with Gavin McGinnis. I started this gang called the Proud Boys. And, the Proud uh, Boys? The Proud Boys. What is the, what's Proud Boys about? A far-right extremist group that promotes white supremacy ideology and proudly promotes violence against groups they don't agree with. Four members of the Proud Boys, that far-right extremist organization, while well, they've been found guilty of seditious conspiracy for their roles in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Like here he is fondly remembering the time his group violently attacked people who were protesting Milo Yiannopoulos at Berkeley. He goes, I started feeling bad it. I started feeling bad after a while because I was just, I could tell these kids had never been in a fight and I was just mowing through them. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, like having a guy on your show who espouses the view that lenient immigration and abortion among white women is leading to white genocide in the West doesn't feel like fruitful, robust dialogue that will open all of our minds and push the boundaries of our discourse. It feels like outraging people with old tribal ideas to get attention. And this is my critique is like, it feels like sometimes Joe will have these people on because they say and do reprehensible things, not in spite of it. I'm taking the low road, I'm punching them in the face. So that's what you're doing with this outfit? Yes. They think they can ruin his work because he jerked off in front of some people. You know, I'm not gonna bow down before them and say you were right, and they want me to. But they weren't right, I'm right, I wrote it, Again, his brand is 
the anti-establishment place where you won't get censored by the woke police. But listen, Joe is absolutely right. Being able to say things, no matter how much I disagree with them, is a vital right. It is an unnatural and precarious thing. People should be able to speak and we must protect that. I believe that. And Joe should absolutely legally be allowed to give his giant megaphone to whoever he wants. But that doesn't mean I'm not gonna critique it. Because listen, having this open-minded, likable guy who's very good at entertaining us give his megaphone to other dudes who promote violence, who tear down science, who invent fake facts and talk about them like they're real, it doesn't promote curiosity. It normalizes lying. It validates factlessness, which is something that if you haven't heard, we already have a problem with. We're already battling that. Nuclear bombs actually don't exist that uh, they never actually figured it out, but they realized that the, the threat of nuclear bombs is good enough. But Eddie, you can see the bombs. The atom bombs? But you how do you know by seeing off. them that they're Did real? You and this feeling really hit me when I was listening to the episode with Alex Jones. Alex Jones, a man who has created an empire off of promoting lies and warped information so that he can sell health supplements. Our fertility is being targeted and it's dropping across the Western world. Ladies and gentlemen, Anthroplex is the newest addition at InfoWarsLife.com. A man who was recently ordered to pay $1.5 billion in damages to the families of the Sandy Hook shooting victims for spreading lies about the shooting being a hoax. And yet here he is on the Joe Rogan experience, getting a chance to tell his side of the story. When I started getting accused four years ago, a couple years into it, and I said, no, I think it happened. Then people that I had interviewed and things started saying, he's involved, he's one of them. Because he you are now saying that it happened, they thought that you had been compromised. Yes, and then I was realizing, oh, this is a, how it works. A certain percentage of people are schizophrenic. Exactly. And then they just think everything's a conspiracy. Well, this now listen, I'm gonna tell you the truth right now and admit something, which is that when I watched this, I actually had a moment where I was like, oh my God, like here's Alex Jones in this like very calm environment. He's not like yelling like he does on InfoWars. My heart's big. It's got hot blood going through it fast. I like to eat. I like to have children. And I literally thought like, wait, is Alex Jones like, was he wrongfully accused or was this overly exaggerated? Was this like a witch hunt to censor this guy because he's like kind of has far right views? Because this felt like a proper moment for Jones to tell his side of the story. I began to realize because I was on the receiving end of people pulling up in white vans with guns at my office saying, I know you put a microchip in my head and I'm going to kill you. So I came out and I said, listen, I never sent anybody to the houses, but I apologize if it was taken out of context. People have a right to question, but I, I'm sorry for the families and I'm sorry for your hurt and I get it and I've experienced crazy people now, big time, just like you have, please stop saying that I'm saying it didn't happen. And he nearly persuaded me. But wait, no, no. Then I remembered that my full-time job is to do journalism. No one died in 2012 in Sandy Hook. And luckily, I sit around and fact check things all day. And I researched it. And I reminded myself that there's actually not a ton of nuance here. The facts. Alex Jones repeatedly claimed that the Sandy Hook shooting was a staged event orchestrated by the globalists, the government, to promote gun control. That's why the globalists use children's deaths to go after our guns, because they know it gets to us. He suggested that the grieving parents were crisis actors and that no children had actually died. Early on, I said, well, they had to have killed somebody. I mean, this doesn't make sense. Then parents come out and start laughing and then turn to the camera and cry. These grieving families who had experienced unimaginable horror had to relocate because of the harassment they received in part due to Jones peddling of this lie so that it could sell health supplements. These are facts that are available to all of us, okay? And yet, I don't know about you, but if I weren't a full-time journalist who was paid to go down rabbit holes and check facts, I'm not sure I would have gone and done this. I'm not sure I would have gone and reviewed all of the facts and wrestled with them in my mind, especially not after listening to two and a half hours of Alex Jones talking. I think the idea of trusting your viewer to go fact check everything you say is irresponsible and naive. I spend every day of my life making sure that the things I tell you are factually accurate. If I get something wrong, it's a cardinal sin. In a world of algorithms and misinformation and Russian bots, it becomes nearly impossible to fact check everything you see, which is why we rely on trusted voices to help us navigate the information out there, to help us navigate what is real and what is not. So instead, Alex Jones, a man who makes money off lies, gets to tell his side of the story. 
And what does he do with his time? Surprise, he lies. The amount of Sandy Hook coverage against me has been so insane and so huge because it's supposed to be the first domino that once I'm taken down, then all the dominoes fall. He tells a story about how this was all one big conspiracy to take him down. Now, of course, there is more nuance to this conversation as usual. Rogan does push back a few times. I don't think that's, I, I think the majority of them are angry because the narrative has been that you're sending people to these Sandy Hook families' homes. homes. But I guess I'm wondering why, why is this the person that you want on your show, Joe. You're a curious, open-minded guy, and you've decided that this guy, this guy's voice, is who deserves your megaphone to 11 million people. And this doesn't even get to the other hours that Jones has on Rogan's show, where he outlines his theories on genetics and race. Native Americans, you can mind control really fast. Hmm, why is that? Well, it's like Vietnam. So Asians are about the most fearless killers there are. You're like, yeah, Native Americans, they're the, they're the best out there. They can do mind, you, the, Native Americans are the easiest to do mind reading to because you know, they're like one unit and the Asians, they're, it's just like so f crazy. Oh, and this clip has less nuance. Like if you listen to the whole thing, you're actually just watching Alex Jones talking nonstop about totally bullshit theories on race and genetics. And Joe is just sitting there nodding his head. Native so Americans are gung-ho and they're tough and they're ready to fight. And I'm, you know, I'm part Native American, only like 6% Comanche and, you know, uh, Texas. And just that little bit makes me wild. No, they're not breaking any laws. This is their right. But what the f***? This isn't exploring both sides. This isn't nuanced conversation. This is pretend information framed as rigorous discussion echoing ideas and thought processes that have been used for centuries to divide and demean people. This isn't balanced conversation, it's faulty logic and factlessness disguised as discourse. I have no respect for it. And listen, Joe Rogan wouldn't disagree with me fully on this. He knows that putting people on his show helps them, helps their ideas. And um, by the way, I'm not a Trump supporter in any way, shape or form. I've had the opportunity to have him on my show more than once, I've said no, every time. I don't want to help him. This isn't the public square. This isn't a personal conversation between friends sharing ideas. This is a powerful man who commands the attention of millions of people. He has decisions on who he gives his megaphone to and who he does not, and what facts he decides to challenge and which he does not. Okay, wait, but I'm not done. There's nuance to my critique, which is that sometimes letting people with ideas that I find reprehensible talk is actually really good. Most of Joe Rogan's guests are not Alex Jones. They're honestly interesting, stimulating conversations with a lot of really interesting people. And even the ones I disagree with, there is so much value in letting them talk. Like I listened to this two hour conversation with Candace Owens, a political pundit who I deeply disagree with. I mean, she's called Trump the savior of Western civilization. She's called Black Lives Matter, a bunch of whiny toddlers pretending to be oppressed for attention. I deeply disagree with this woman. After listening to the show with Candace Owens, I still deeply disagree with Candace Owens. In fact, I found more reasons to reject her approach to politics and facts. So There's let's say we all agree that Paris global agreement. warming is real. I mm -hmm. don't believe it's real, okay? So I can't but why, sit here. But, but here's I the can't, question, I can't but why have a belief? What do you mean? Why have a belief as to whether or not global warming is real or not real? Because I just, I just find that when things, it, you don't you're understand correct. the science. You are correct. But crucially, suddenly what I couldn't do was hate her like was so easy before. It's really hard to hate someone when you listen to them speak. I received some voicemail messages from about four kids and the, like, you know, the language was, it was pretty strong. It was like, we're gonna tar and feather your family. Um, we're gonna put a bull in the back of your head like we did to Martin Luther King, like, you know, N-word, N-word, N-word. You inconveniently have to see them as a real human with feelings and thoughts and ideas and it becomes a lot harder to just put them into a bucket as someone I should hate. Which of course, as we all know, is a huge thing that we've lost in our world of echo chambers, where we only hear from people that we agree with. And when we do hear from people we disagree with, it's often framed in an outrageous clickbaity article linked on Twitter entitled, watch the senator that you agree with destroy the person you disagree with and reinforce your views that they are a monster and that you are justified in hating them. This is how I knew Candace Owens before I listened to her speak for two hours. But now I see her as a person, a human who holds views that I see as objectively bad for people and our society. 
but I can't dehumanize her. Somebody started doing this prank call and shit on you, and was this... It was a, all in one night. It was all in one yeah, night. Yeah, it was like four voicemails. Was this tied to like a boyfriend no, or so a I, it's, girl I was jealous? I was at a boyfriend's house when I got the calls, and I just like put it aside because it was like blocked number, so I was like, right. I didn't think anything of it. And then like when I listened to it, like it was like some pretty horrific stuff. Like I definitely cried, you know, I was 17 years old. And this gets me to my last takeaway, and then we'll finish up this video which is that Joe Rogan models curiosity and openness, and this is valuable. It is rare and unique to watch a tough guy, fighter, TV host, dirty comedian with a microphone admit that he's wrong. Here's the thing. These are not like planned statements. Let's be real clear. I don't have an off air and on air voice. I don't. No. I have me. This, this is, is us. it. You typically don't see stuff like this. Do I get things wrong? Absolutely, I get things wrong, but I try to correct them. And when it comes to powerful men in this world, most of the loudest voices are the ones promoting a confident, macho, nightmare version of masculinity. Nobody would be tougher on ISIS than Donald Trump. And while I don't vibe with all of the ways that Joe expresses his manhood, I think he is a force for good in this department, in showing an eagerness to ask questions and an ability to change his mind. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, my critique is that I think he overuses this persona, this confident, curious persona of, I don't know anything, I'm not an expert. Like, if you say you disagree with me, I probably disagree with me too. Yeah. When I say something stupid, I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say before I say it. I'm right. just saying it. To tacitly validate deceiving information and to give voice to opportunistic characters. And so in the end, I'm not really sure if this modeling of an open mind outweighs the proliferation of seductively fake facts and ideas, especially in a time where truth and facts are already scarce and under siege and creating confusion for all of us. Dude, they're keeping, they have human animal hybrids. There's the, the freaking. I have been there when people that work for the Pentagon say that they, we go to the laboratory and we meet with the ambassador. We have to take higher and higher doses to meet with them. They're giving us technology and the technology worked. I don't even think it's, clear that carbon dioxide is actually a problem, but we can leave that aside. They say that 80% that of kids who experience any sort of gender dysphoria as children grow out of it. This tension is not unique to Rogan. All media, all news outlets are subject to this seductive temptation to appeal to the worst parts of our nature. Rogan's version of it is unique because he and his show are unique. So for how much I disagree with some of his standards and fact-checking habits, I do take comfort in this guy's commitment to openness, to curiosity. Joe Rogan is a powerful man who changes his mind, who admits when he's wrong, which I think is a much needed counterbalance in an increasingly polarized world. Okay. And sometimes the best way to combat bad speech is to let that speech play out and let good speech overwhelm it with logic and reason and, and a better argument. But if they admit that they're wrong, then they're also admitting that they have horribly disfigured and abused thousands, maybe millions of kids. How many people have had this done? Depends on what. I don't think we have exact numbers, but it's if we're talking about the drugs, it's, I mean, millions. It says okay. over the last five years, there were at least 4,780 adolescents who started puberty blockers and had a prior gender dysphoria diagnosis. Million sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wi-Fi radiation is uh, does all kinds of bad things, including causing cancer. Wi-Fi radiation causes yeah, cancer. Yeah, from your cell phone. I mean, there's cell phone tuner, tumors. You know that. I mean, I'm representing hundreds of people who have cell phone tumors behind the ear. It's always on the ear that you favor with your cell phone. Okay. Hey everyone. Thanks for watching my big long video essay on Joe Rogan. I've been thinking about this one for a long time. Um, let me tell you about a couple of things. Uh, first off, I made a poster, a physical product, a thing that exists in the real world after a decade of making things that only exist in pixels. So look, this is a poster called All Maps Are Wrong. It's a bunch of different map projections, all the different mathematical ways that we can show the world, which is a sphere on a flat plane. This is a poster that you can purchase and put on your wall and help support this channel, which is very appreciated. For other ways to support the channel, you can look at the newsroom. The newsroom is um, our Patreon, where 
our newsroom members support us and they get in exchange an extra video every month which is a behind the scenes vlog all of the shenanigans and the methods and the people and the processes and the everything that we do here in the studio we capture and we put into a vlog that you can watch but really it's about supporting what we're trying to do here which is independent journalism which takes a lot of time and resources. We also have LUTs and presets. LUTs are how we color our video. Presets are how I color photos. We develop these with a professional colorist and they're very good and you can buy them, support the channel and use them. First off, if you're new around here and you're still watching the video, you must be super into what we're doing here. Like you're at the very end of like a super long video and you're still watching and you're new around here. You should probably subscribe. All right, bye. Get out of here, dude.